quiet seaside town, an evil laid to rest centuries ago, has risen. An abandoned fortress deep in the swamp holds a secret that could save the village or destroy it. Now, a band of adventurers sets out to dig up the wounds of the past and bring the light of day to the roots of ruin. This is Tabletop Gold. And welcome to Tabletop Gold, episode 37. My name is Lars Castine, and here's what's going to happen next. I'm going to say the names of the other people on the show. They're going to respond, and it's going to help you. Um, have you ever seen a police procedural story where it's like there's a, a bunch of names and a bunch of photographs, and there's like red yarn connecting the whole thing together, and you kind of build like a, an image of, of a criminal conspiracy uh, on, on a movie? This is going to be like that, but you're the detective, and instead of a uh, cork board, it's this podcast. I think you're just talking about an always sunny meme. Right. Do you know how in movies Charlie Day is posing in front of like a, <laughs> a, a board? Let's say hello to everybody. David the Tin Man Chernikov is here. I, I'm hi him. <laughs> yeah, I'm him. He is me, and I'm him. Uh, Robin Lang is here. I am. And apologies. I'm getting very distracted by my cat tonight. He's actually Can he you put never the cat on the microphone. Yeah, get him on mic. I he if you hear any meowing in the background, that's him. He never keeps me company while I record, and tonight he's like all around my feet and whining at me a little bit. He knows it's going to be a great episode, and he's got the best seat Are in the you house. Eating pate. I I did just finish some tuna. Uh could that be the could tuna. Be it. Yeah. That could be it. Zoe Chernikoff is also here. It is me. I am here. And our Matt Humphreys is here as well. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Look, I'm going to be honest with you. We've got a big episode coming up. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things happening. We're right on the precipice of, a, of just a big old combat. And I say, let's, let's not beat around the bush anymore. Let's just jump straight into it, shall Wait, we? Wait, this thing wants to fight us? <laughs> oh no, spoiler. <laughs> we gave Boy, it a snack. Did we prep wrong for this. <laughs> like a free yeah. snack. <laughs> but yeah, so we're just gonna jump straight into it, guys. No warm-up, no, no preamble, nothing like that. Listen, if you are enjoying Tabletop Gold, please rate and review us on your podcast app of choice. Join the literal thousands of people who have already done it. Thousands. Don't. Uh, don't double check that number before you write the review, please. <laughs> <laughs> Over the last day or so, you've been on the hunt. After hearing rumors about a strange sea monster in the ruins beneath Gauntlet, you've done a little research and discovered that the creature in question is a river drake named Fresnel Cache. It turns out this Fresnel Cache has not only terrorized the Morlock cult that took up camp near her lair, but also travelers all throughout the Fog Fen. Now, armed with some helpful information, you're standing on the banks of her underwater cave, and the blue green dragon like creature has burst from a pool of clear, still water to engage you in combat. So let's let's just get straight into it, and everybody, please. Yeah. Yeah. Roll for initiative. Roll for initiative. So before I get the numbers, there are a couple of things that I want to spell out. The last thing that happened in our game was that Mag as a survival check, tried to, did a survival check to try to coax Fresnel Cash out of the water. 
You rolled a 22 on that survival check, and if you want to, Mag, you can use that as your initiative roll. Oh, oh, oh. Hmm. Sure, I'll keep that. Okay, the other thing to say is that Norman, the last thing that Norman did was cast a spell, which means that Norman is not sneaking, is not using deception as per normal. So Norman's going to have to roll perception for initiative and gives up the opportunity to use surprise attack. So nobody's going to be flat-footed to Norman in this first round automatically. But the spell that Norman cast, Forbidding Ward, onto Mag is an incredibly helpful defensive spell. We'll see what happens. So let's get a sense of what everybody's role is. Uh, Trill rolled a 22, which is respectable. Tied with David. Zoe, what did you roll? Norman, I guess having maybe literally never entered a battle just on regular initiative battle terms, uh, did get a natural one for an eight. So Norman, very slow. That could be terrible in this situation. We'll see what happens. And Armat, what did you roll for Vadim? Vadim got a 13, so a little slow off the mark uh, for Vadim as well. So the fastest uh, player characters are 22. Fresnelkesh rolled a 23 on her initiative, meaning that she is going to go first. Yeah, she has home cavern advantage. Uh, boo. So true. Yes. So here we are. It's the top of round one. Fresnelkesh is about to go. You are standing on the southern shore of this 10-foot deep, crystal clear underground pond. Fresnelkesh has just emerged from the water, flapping her wings, spraying you with water. And here comes her turn at the beginning of this incredibly dangerous aquatic encounter. Her long neck starts to move back and forth as it appears that she is trying to pull some sort of phlegm out from her throat. She opens her mouth and blasts a ball of caustic mucus Ooh. out at you that lands on the ground right behind Vadim and explodes, coating all of you oh, come on. with acid. Oh. I need everybody. No, I don't care for that. No, it's not fun. Oh it's not God, good. Oh my God, that's so many dice. <laughs> yes, that is, I just rolled 4d6. Let me tell you what the numbers that I just rolled on these dice were. Six, 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 and six. Lars, Shut liar. Stop up. cheating. But you have 24 damage coming at you. In order to avoid some of that damage, I need everybody to make a reflex save to attempt to dodge out of the way as this ball of mucus flies towards you. Kidoki. Uh, Trill got a 21. Norman, hating mucus, got a 29. Um, Mag uh, was too focused on looking at the River Drake and so only reacted with a 12. Oof. Vadim uh, got a 25, so also a mucus hater, apparently. <laughs> okay. So here's what happens. Mag fails, not critically, nearly critically, but does not critically fail... Oh that saving throw. So she is going to take 24 points of damage rather than 48. Okay, that's good. Could I maybe could we maybe glimpse that? Absolutely. A lot of damage. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Lars looks uh, so bad. <laughs> it's just like is that how that works? <laughs> yeah. That's ex that's everyone, literally how it works. Yeah. I assume everyone has pick these one ideas. Of us. An enemy damages your ally and both are within 15 feet of you. Yes, totally. You can glimpse that. Hey. Well, I guess let's let's see if anybody else failed it as badly as no, I did. No, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, we know yeah. we didn't. Okay. Yeah. So, so Trill, Trill just meets the DC of, of 21. Ooh. So she just barely manages to miss half of it. She'll take 12 points of damage. Okay. Vadim also misses half of it, takes, takes 12 points of damage. Norman is standing behind cover gets a bonus to his reflex save, and as such, critically succeeds, taking zero damage. Ah, nice. that normie life. Hey, just ducking behind Trill for safety. Um, One question, is David getting the benefit of forbidding Ward when he rolls? That's wrapped into what he's rolling? It should be, yeah. yeah. Okay, Let's double cool. check. Yes, I'll it double is. Check. It All is. Right. Yeah. So, so, 
That is so. So that's a great point. The only reason Mag did not critically fail that reflex save was because Norman just put a forbidding ward right on top of her. Oh, nice. If not for that, Mag would have taken forty-eight points of damage. Oh. It's absolutely a hero point for Norman. Well, done. Right. that's huge. Yeah, that's that is awesome. huge. Thanks, Norman. And with the next action from Fresnelkesh. Wait, sorry. Can we can can we resolve the glimpse? What happens with the glimpse? Is she getting uh, b- b- befuddled or? If somebody tells me that they are glimpsing, I will resolve a glimpse. I glimpse. would love to glimpse that. Uh, <laughs> let's glimpse that. So the way damage. this game works is that if you tell me something <laughs> happens, then I can do something wait with minute, it. Wait but wait if you I'm discuss, sorry. maybe we'll do something. <laughs> sorry, I, I thought st- it was. That's just a conversation between you guys. <laughs> I thought it was tacitly understood that when David nothing is tacitly <laughs> understood when it comes to glimpse of redemption, I'm not just going to auto glimpse all of your attacks. You <laughs> have to tell me. We did say it. I mean, I thought there was an understanding. Yeah. Oh my god. An unspoken okay. thing. So in glimpsing that, what is going to happen is that Mag is going to resist, of those 24 points of damage, is going to resist five points. And Fresnel Kish will become enfeebled too as the strength gets sapped out of her body. Of the 24, I'm taking 19, is that right? Correct. Okay. And with her third action, Fresnel Kesh is going to back slowly into the cave, putting more distance between you and her, looking you straight in the eye and flapping her wings menacingly. It is now either Trill or Mag's turn. Who would like to go first since you tied for initiative? That seems like Trill would be the right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. (laughs) Off to you. So we learned some stuff about Fresnel Cash in town, right? Yeah, you know from town that Fresnel Cash has a reaction where she will fend off attacks with her tail and that she is resistant to acid damage. Trill wipes off some of this gross acidy phlegm, or I guess shakes it off, and oh, this is oh, I don't like this one bit. You know, you actually like it even less of one bit than I told you because of all this distraction with the glimpse of redemption. Oh no, is it going to be persistent? It is going to be persistent. Everybody who failed the save, which oh. means just, just mag, mag, is going to take 1d6 persistent acid damage. Is that conveniently going to be six every time? Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> uh, that would be quite convenient, yes. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so Trill, Trill, what would you like to do? Chill's going to, on her harp, play a couple chords and immediately uh, work on some lingering composition into a, and some Inspire Courage. And that lingering composition is going to be a 29? That is a critical success. Yes, yes. As Trill's uh, voice fills this under this natural cavern. So looking at the map, in front of Mag and Vadim, I see a bit of water. Let's talk about this water, Lars. Yeah, this water is 10 feet deep and it is crystal clear. Here's the way it works if you'd like to get into that water. If you end your turn in water and you have not taken an action to swim, you will start to sink underwater, at which point you will need to start holding your breath. Now, even if you're like in the first little, like right kind of stepping into the water where it's kind of like that little beachy entrance. That's right. It is a 10 foot deep sheer drop off. Oh, You different. are currently right now, the area that you are is tiptoeing into the water. Oh, okay. The area marked as the water on the map is the water. Okay. And is Trill 10 feet tall or is she not 10 feet tall? Trill is currently 10 foot tall. She cast Inspiring <laughs> yeah. Height uh, yeah. and got a critical success. So she is big. That y'all. is so cool. <laughs> um, yeah. So in order to move in the water, you have to take the swim action. So that is typically an athletics check that you make. But this water is very still and very calm. So I'm not going to ask anybody to make that athletics check. You will just automatically succeed. When you try to swim while you're in the water and you succeed, you will move you get to move up to 10 feet through the water as you put as you swim your way forward. So you get slowed way down. 
If you'd like to move more than 10 feet, you can make that athletics check that I said I was wave hand waving. And if you critically succeed, you will get to go 15 feet rather than 10 feet. Still not that far. Still no, not that not far. not that far. Swimming is still difficult. The other things that you want to know is once you are in the water, you are more vulnerable. You will be flat-footed to any attacks while you are in the water unless you have what's called a swim speed, which is to say that you automatically get to swim. Nobody here has that. And if at any point you try to attack through the water, you will potentially take a penalty to that roll if you're doing bludgeoning or slashing uh, melee attacks. If you attack with a piercing attack through the water, you do not take that penalty because a piercing attack moves more aerodynamically, more fluid dynamically through the water. And then the other thing that you need to know is that fire and acid do not work in the water that well. Anything that is in the water will gain resistance to fire and acid, which could potentially come in handy for Mag with her persistent acid damage. And while you're in the water, you can't cast fire spells, you can't use fire abilities because it's water, guys. This The rules of this game actually make sense, sort Duh, of. Duh, obviously. So, 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 Robin, to answer your question, that's what the deal is with this water. Great. Well, this feels like a really good time then for uh, Ray of Frost. Okay. So Troll's going to go ahead and cast Ray of Frost at um, fr Freshy Fresh, whatever its uh, name is. That's its name. It's now, <laughs> it's Freshy Fresh now. In ongoing <laughs> songs, I think of when Trill does something, anytime she casts Ray of Frost, my mind goes, I don't, I'm, I'm not even going to get the melody right, but the um, double mint gum, icy cool flavor, <laughs> icy cool breath that lasts and lasts. So anyways, that's what's going on for me over here. I love your internal everything. Weird songs. Um, <laughs> not the greatest attack roll that ended up being a 15. And that's going to be a mess. The Drake okay. manages to twist out of the way as this line of frost passes nearby. Alas. Okay. Okay, guys. We got a fight ahead of us. And with that, it is now Mag's turn. Mag is taking this persistent acid damage and has magical warding surrounding her. What will Mag do? As the acid, a, sh a sheet of acid splashes in Mag's direction, landing uh, all across the left side of her body. Mag um, screams. Let's see, what would that, what would she say? She'd probably say something like, um, ah! <laughs> it checks out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, upon raging, she whips her head around and she leaps into the water to go after the drake. Ooh. Now, because I've ended up in the water, how does that affect my, my persistent acid damage? Man, really, maybe I shouldn't have kept that 22 for initiative. Yoinks. <laughs> so, uh, so the persistent acid damage while you're in the water is going to be largely negated. So you're taking a D6 of acid damage, and you have resistance 5 to acid and fire. So chances are you're not going to be taking any of this persistent acid damage while you're in the water. And as Mag considers this, she wonders if that was the point oh. of that maybe you were being coaxed into the water. Oh, like like a prey thing. You like get them to come. Oh, get wow. their, oh in, their like very superficial injury addressed, and then you eat them alive or whatever. I don't know if that would have occurred to Mag at all, but no. David is now <laughs> considering it very deeply. <laughs> um, it occurs to me that like. Vadim and I should probably stay pretty close together, so I'm in glimpse range. Yes. That will then take him further away from everybody else, but it seems like Trill and Norman should be staying far away from this freaking thing. Yes. Anyway, so are we all feeling we all feel okay about going twosies and twosies on this? Yep. <laughs> okay. But cool. you have one more action, right? I gotta use it to swim. Oh gotcha. Yes. I might argue maybe move to its flank so that I can then I could potentially get a attack on it uh, this mm. round if you're in flanking position. Right. So I will swim then to the Drake's immediate right, hopefully setting up flanking for Vadim. So as Mag passes over to uh, the right of Fresnel Cash at the end of Mag's turn, that's going to be four points of acid damage. You resist all of it. All right. Ooh, and go nice. ahead and give me that uh, recovery check. That's a seven. 
the acid clings to Mag's body as Vadim sees it as time to act. Seeing Mag leap forward into the water, he gets a grin on his face and he says, Agon, wait for me. I, you don't get to have all the fun. And he will leap 10 feet into the water. Splash! And then swim another 10 feet forward to flank on the other side of the drake. And he is going to make a melee attack at it with vigilance, slicing down above the water to try and get at its exposed flank. And as the sword moves through the air, with lightning speed, Fresnel Kesh's tail swip, <gasps> flashes out All right. and targets Vadim's arm with a terrible roll, a 14 to hit. So Ooh. Vadim raises his uh, vigilance that's a 16 to hit. That 16 does does not hit. Even though you're flanking Fresnel Kesh, it gets a claw up and pushes Vigilance out of the way. So that is the end of Vadim's turn. Norman, you're st Norman is standing just a little around a corner looking out onto this pond from the south. And Zoe, this is the first time that you've had a sustained spell. The deal yeah. with Forbidding Ward is that you need to spend an action each round to keep it going or it will fade. Oh, okay, man, I got, I, I got your back. Um, and he steps <laughs> up um, like to the edge of the beach and then uh, extends Forbidding Ward because he feels like Mag's in the heat of the battle. And then he's going to use his last turn. He's got chompers at the ready and he's going to try and hit this horrible dragon, which is surely about to do far, far worse things to all of them right now. Oh, and Norman rolls a 20 on the die for a yes. 29. Oh, yes. Woo. Yeah. You gotta draw. Nice, nice, nice. It's been a while nice. since nice. we've heard that. Yeah. So Zoe, the crit card that you just drew is called Hand Wound. So mm -hmm. your arrow finds one of Fresnel Kesha's hands at the end of her wingspan. Okay. Until healed, the target is clumsy too. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Which is going to ding her armor class, which is huge. Love yeah, that. That's Love that for us. And she can't use one of her hands, determined randomly by the GM. I'm gonna say, uh, right hand is off the table for Fresnel Cash. Are you saying that because she's left-handed? I'm. She's left-handed. All of her attacks yeah. are with her left hand. Yeah. That was in yeah. the scouting report. Go ahead and roll <laughs> critical damage, please. Uh, that is 11 points of damage. So yeah, the 11 points of damage from Norman is huge, but this constant clumsiness as she is as she has to twist to to sort of nurse one side of her body over another that is huge like that is huge i cannot overstate what a game changer that is for <laughs> for this yeah. i welcome Norman. the change for one yeah. i don't know how everyone else feels <laughs> yeah. but i welcome it yeah, so please. here we are. It's the top of round two as the arrow punctures Fres the end of Fresnel Kesh's wing. Vadim, Fresnel Kesh, and Mag, water is flying up in the air, splashing all around as the three of them are in just hand to hand combat while Norman and Trill are 20, 25 feet away watching from the shore. At the beginning of her turn, what the wounded Fresnel Kesh is going to do is fly into an absolute frenetic rage as she looks up in the air. Ah! Checks out. And targeting Vadim, who hit her hardest, she extends her mouth, clamps down with a fang strike onto Vadim. That is an 18 to hit. Uh, ties go to the defender, to me. am I right? <laughs> no, no that to the roller. Uh, it's exactly 18. So that's a huge it. bite as as she, she pierces Vadim for 12 points of damage, and then her tail just goes... Wait, with that, I want to use a hero card? A hero wait, point wait, card? Wait, 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 wait. Zoe, I'm not sure it's good enough to use. Okay. The card wait. is when a hero is damaged by a bite attack, and, and shout out Justin from Portland on this thank you for the for the hero point card in our discord the hero pulls out one tooth 
from the attacking creature. The attacking creature takes a minus three to all bite attacks until the end of its next turn. Well, so I is it going to bite I anyone this again is... this turn? But yeah. next turn, too. Yeah, if it's includes... next turn. Oh, it includes the following mm, turn. More yes. bites. Let's... Let's do it. I've Let's got three it. hero points. I like it. So Norman is feeling like the main character in this fight. Let's be honest. He feels like the main character <laughs> in all of these fights, but in this fight in particular. Um, and he is going to use a hero point card from Justin in Portland, Oregon called, Hey Norman, look what I've got, which I assume is what Vadim's about to say. Um, yeah. And it is when a hero is damaged by a bite attack, which has just happened, that hero, Vadim, pulls out one tooth from the attacking creature, and the creature takes a minus three to all bite attacks, not only on this turn, but through its next turn. So as the drake clamps down on Vadim's shoulder, he wrenches it out of its mouth and gripping a tooth, manages to take a tooth out as well. Shocked, he looks up, looks back to Norman and goes, Hey, Norman. Look what I've got! <laughs> and waggles uh, the tooth in his dagger hand for a second, uh, cackling madly as he does. <laughs> this fight is going better than I could have helped. <laughs> and as it reels back in pain as this tooth is ripped from its uh, its poor defenseless skull, Aww. two Aww. quick tail strikes come out at Vadim. The first one is going to be a 17 to hit. And again, it's only because she's enfeebled that that misses. Nice. And then the, the tail comes out again, this time a 14, as it just blindly strikes over and over again at Vadim. And then at the end of its turn, it is going to swim five feet underwater. Boo. Ooh as it hides underneath the water for a brief moment. How does it, is it like a seabird? How does it sit on top of the water? It's like a seabird. It's basically a big penguin with, okay. um, <laughs> it's a big, it's a penguin. A big, clumsy, enfeebled penguin. It's a big, penguin. clumsy, enfeebled penguin. And yeah. at the end of its turn, Fresno Cash is going to no longer be enfeebled. Trill, seeing this creature slip underneath the water, sees it as time to act. Indeed it is. How, how's a magic missile for uh, cutting through water? It's uh, ineffable. It always works. I like that oh. word. Mm. Uh, Trill is... What a good spell. Somewhat annoyed that her... Uh, uh, that her ray of frost didn't hit, so... <sighs> well, if the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over and n expecting a different result, so... <laughs> Trill plays a couple different chords and let's throw off some magic missile. Did Trill just quote Einstein? <laughs> <laughs> Do they have Einstein and Galarian? There's a, a thin barrier between our realities. Trill's He's actually very, very <laughs> consistency. He carries over. Right, look, Ferasma does like not it. play dice with the universe, y'all. <laughs> Trill's seen a lot, okay? She's seen a lot. She's met a lot of people. She's been a lot of places. Um, and Trill's going to use all three actions for this magic missile. All right. These magic missiles sweep up through the air and narrow in. <laughs> And come straight for Freshy Fresh, who's just under the water, and they go straight in, down through that top layer of water to hit her for nine points of damage. Uh, and I'm going to give you an extra point of damage to that because of... Oh, did Inspire. Inspire Courage not come through? Yeah, it didn't come through. So actually, it was ten points of damage. Oh, ten points of damage. Woo! Ha ha! Nice. And as Mag sees these three darts flying through the air and hitting, it is her turn. Uh... Okay, so Mag is keen to start hitting. <laughs> yeah. It's been a Max minute. Smash. Or I guess it's been six seconds. But six seconds is a long time to go without hitting when yeah. you live to hit. Yeah. Yeah. Lars, how does hitting work with underwater oh, or with like a third dimension and with underwater? These are both new circumstances for. So me. she's still within five feet of you. She is within your reach. So you can swing and hit her. 
However, your if you attack with a slashing or bludgeoning attack, you're going to take a minus two circumstance penalty to that as it is difficult for you to slice through the water. Got it, got it. Well, I could dive down 10 feet, so uh, so Vadim and I are, like, diagonally flanking her, but I have a feeling she'd try and hold me down there, so I don't think I want to do that. Um, well, I was just like, go kill yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> Keep in mind, also, though, that she's going to take the same penalty with her slashing or bludgeoning attacks. So she'll be able to bite you underwater, but she does have that penalty to her bite. Well, yeah. plus the extra the extra penalty from before. I mean, not to rub it in, but there's like an additional minus three penalty. No, that's that's the one I was talking about. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Oh, cool. oh, I thought you meant an underwater <laughs> biting. Okay. No, I'm I'm extremely aware of exactly how you've ruined uh, everything. For my beautiful, <laughs> my beautiful, beautiful uh, killer penguin that I was okay. hoping to destroy you all with. With a, a, crit, a crit card and a listener hero point card, have taken a couple of a couple of bites out of this out of this. Yes. Drink. All right. True. God, I love our listeners. <laughs> Batman. Oh, well, different penguin. <laughs> That's this, right. This has been fun. I would like to hit the dragon now, please. Sure. <laughs> she winds up and strikes two-handed for a twenty-six to hit. That 26, even with, which is actually a 24, because you are slicing through the water. Okay. You feel the resistance of the water as you cut through it with the enormous bastard sword. That's still going to hit. All right. But so Fresnel Kesh is going to react and try to bash your hand out of the way sure. with her tail. Okay. Glimpse, so here comes the please. tail strike. Here comes the tail strike. That's a 25 to hit. A uh, twenty-five will hit. Glimpse, please. And here comes and here comes the damage. And now's the now you can glimpse. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to glimpse, please. Okay, glimpse so that. I rolled ten points of damage. That's going to be reduced by five, down to just five points of damage, as the as the energy saps out of Fresnel Cash one more time. Her little clumsy hand and her little clumsy mouth. Aww. Yeah, you guys are really little... giving her the business. Yeah, oh, we're just little nibbles out of all of it. All right, I'm going to give you that damage for the two-handed bastard sword strike. And that is 18 damage. And that's a huge hit as you get the feeling that you nice. have, that that she is pretty badly injured at this point. We're just, try we're just trying to get vengeance for the Morlock King. David, you have two more actions. I do, and, and there's a a couple things I've thought about, but this turn, I'm just going to try hitting her again. Hit, hit, hit. It looks like with the penalty for being in the water, that is a 20 to hit. So what that means is it is only because she was knocked clumsy by Norman's arrow Ooh. through her Ooh. hand <laughs> that that is going to hit. All right. And that is... <laughs> Ah, that is 26 damage on the second <laughs> And with that, Mag slices through her belly, and a few moments later, she rises to the surface of the water as you have killed <gasps> my beautiful, my beautiful penguin. Oh, that was so fast! <laughs> as what? Fresnel Cash is no more. I mean... Mag just did like fifty points of damage in one <laughs> turn. I mean, like <laughs> Mag awesome. is a beast. That was a lot of damage. You could argue that striking rune is overpowered for level three. <laughs> <laughs> you could argue, Lars, that uh, you made a mistake letting him do that. I follow. What I do is I follow the rules of the game, and that cuts <laughs> that cuts me sometimes. That cuts you sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yes, one might say that a level four striking rune is quite effective at that level three. That feels amazing. Lars, you sent around a post where it was talking about like different kinds of players and different kinds of playing style. I think it was from, from the Yeah, it's GM from guide. the D&D fourth edition uh, uh, dungeon master guide. Yeah, and it was like, you know, there's people who like to, there's people who like to explore and there's people who like to figure out puzzles and there's people who like to, I, I, I think, you know, I think I just really like, um, successfully killing stuff. The homicidal <laughs> player. Yep. Uh, murder hobo is the, the technical term, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Dude, yes. <laughs> dude who's been in his house for three years. I, I was a little, I'm a little bummed because I was really excited to try. Uh, I was like, okay, 
I'm, I'm going to try Ray of Frost again. I'm going to see if it hits this time because I really want to get what, a couple more hits into this guy to her. And we only got two rounds. I know. You did it in I two rounds. I was really excited to double slice and like pierce down into the water. But I was going to grab it and see if it like took me down underneath or whatever. Nope, we did it in two rounds. Yeah. We defeated think... a water drake in two rounds. Let's fight another one. My uh, Inspire Courage is... Still there. The, the Inspire Courage came through big also. Like, I called yeah. out that yeah. that clumsy, but the Inspire Courage was was just as relevant in yeah, that situation I mean, there's, also. Yeah, I mean, there's, like, l- so many modifiers happening in this fight. From Inspire, from Forbidding Ward, from the Crit card, from the Listener Hero Point card, from the Water, from the, from, right. in my case, from Rage, like, all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, this game is, like, kind of about modifiers. Like, there's a thing that people who are new to this game are like, I only get a plus two to that. That's stupid, but it's like, Plus two rules. Right, actually. That <laughs> wins the game, guys. Yeah. yeah. Plus and two also, on top of plus one on top of another plus one on top right. of another plus two. Yeah. The runes, yeah. the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, this, I, this game does, like, power fantasy very, very well. I think Trill is going to be excited with where Norman is headed next when we're done feeling totally victorious about this totally <sighs> victorious fight. Oh. Ooh. Well, I'm excited to see, to see what, what that is. Before before we get to that, Zoe, yeah. real quick. Um, Mag is taking this persistent acid damage. Mag is in the water. We're going to hand wave it. The no, acid no, no. damage is going to wear off. Let's do the thing like we did last time where I have to keep <laughs> rolling D20s for the next like, 45 minutes. <laughs> Five episodes ago where we were doing that for 20 minutes. <laughs> I, had more, I had more fun with that than you guys did, but I, I hear you. Vadim almost died. He got real yeah, low. Yeah, Vadim if, almost like, died. Uh, you hadn't used the soothe wand. That I didn't been... mind. I didn't mind it at all. I didn't mind it at real all. Real bad. So Zoe, you were saying that that Norman's next steps. Uh, what are those next steps? So Norman is like Trill. Trill. I, I mean, we did it. That's incredible. But there's treasure out there. <gasps> Do you, let's let's go get a. I, I mean, I can't. Can you swim? I can't swim. Let's get a boat and see if we can go find that treasure. There's a treasure. So I feel like Norman is going to go back and try and get Trill to help him drag two boats out in the water so that they can like load Mag and Vadim into one and he and Trill can take one to sort of like scope around in this cave cove. Yeah. Trill will help with that. Yeah. So so you can spend, uh, let's say that takes about 10 minutes as, as you find a boat that looks more or less structurally intact. I think this is a relatively simple thing to do. This water is very still, like I said, it's only 10 feet deep. So even if a boat lets a little bit of water into it, you have plenty of time to to move around in this smaller area without getting too uh, in too much danger. Say, compared to if there were an active drake flying around in there as you were sinking. <laughs> right. Like yeah. the drake maybe Order. makes this boat less desirable, but without the drake, this boat seems pretty okay for spending a few minutes tooling around in this natural underground cavern. So do the four of you load into this small dinghy that Can Norman we all fit in one? Is that sure. like one will fit? Yeah, oh, great. no problem. Yeah. Great. Uh, Norman, obviously in the process of getting the boat in the water, I think we all know what's coming, but he puts his sailor outfit on. <laughs> <laughs> Adding an Norman, additional 10 minutes jaunty. while everyone treads water. Trill, uh, Trill plays a jaunty tune on her harp. Oh, like a sea shanty? Yeah. What will you do with a drunken sailor? What will you do with a drunken sailor? What Lock him in the hold with the captain. Sailor. No. Mag uses Trill as an eye patch. <laughs> and it actually, it doesn't take you long. You move about 10 feet forward. Um, and, and is everybody searching for, for treasure in here as you're moving f- through the room? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. Can you yes. give me up? Can you give me blind perception checks, please? So you push, so so you all start searching the area. You're in this kind of rickety, half-rotting um, dinghy. And you move about 15 feet into this cavern around here, into the middle of the cavern. And um, oddly enough, it's only Norman who doesn't see. <laughs> <laughs> well, Norman's probably distracted, like, Finishing the touches on his sailor. Right, right. He's getting his, right? his, yeah, his sash just to the right side. Yo, so ho, excited yo, for the ho. treasure. Just and I see Norman like and, standing yeah. up at the front of it with his knee up high. Yeah, <laughs> Rubicon. I'm a sailor. I sail. <laughs> and what Norman doesn't see that the rest of you do is a tangle of roots 
at the southern edge of the westernmost alcove within this underwater grotto. Hmm. And you see a, a small chest that if you were to lean forward out of the boat, you would be able to jostle to free it from these roots. Mag jostles. The boat tips forward as Mag's weight starts pulling, f- pulling down on the boat. And then a few seconds later, Mag is able to water pouring off of this airtight chest, put it down on the floor of this dinghy between the four of you. And Norman in character screams, man, the starboard main and runs to the other side to help even out the boat. <laughs> <laughs> and the boat remains seaworthy for now. For now. Norman, it's just a dinghy. Uh, aye, aye, Captain. I'm sorry. Is there no hero point for that incredibly, incredibly well timed understanding of ballast? <laughs> <laughs> you got a ballast point for that. Oh, oh. It's a, it's a, that's a, an invisible resource that I don't, I don't bring up on microphone, but I do track them. Ballast yeah. point cards will be accepted. Soon yes. on the we're, ta- we're taking yeah. ballast point cards for sure. <laughs> that sounds like another Discord ballast channel. Ballast point cards. So I just want to zo- I want to zoom out for a second. Basically, what happened is you put this dinghy in the water and you went about fifteen feet and found some treasure. Uh, Yay. <laughs> but yeah, you've got this you've got this chest sitting on the dinghy between the four of you. Let's open it. Yeah. So Trill reaches forward to pop this chest open and finds a number of interesting items inside it. The first thing that she spots is a bunch of gold pieces. She methodically counts them and finds that there are 36 of them. Oh, fantastic. She also finds a strange object that she doesn't immediately recognize that looks like a compass covered with strange patterns. Ooh. Hmm. Cool. She also finds a wand oh. that as she looks over it, she knows precisely what this is. It is a wand that casts the spell True Strike. Oh. Oh, that's awesome which is a spell that you can cast for two actions, which lets you roll a d20 on your next deal and take the better result. I think True Strike is a one-action spell. True Strike is a one-action spell. Good call, Armat. Sorry nice. about that. You get another ballast point. <laughs> oh, yes! <laughs> so oh, my... wow. Ballast points are coming out the wazoo. <laughs> I'm going to be able to upgrade this dinghy to a caravel soon. Hey. And the last thing that Trill finds in this chest is a human baby alive and needing <laughs> to be cared for. So, humans, you have found me. <laughs> I play this game to get away from that. <laughs> Let's, we put the baby back in the chest. It's a beautifully handcrafted loot <gasps> with <gasps> gold leaf all around it in ornate patterns. But you're not really sure exactly what this is. You can spend some time identifying uh, this compass-looking object and this loot. Um, Yes, true, we'll do that. Norman says, oh, I always wanted a loot. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) (laughs) Shakes a very Marge Simpson sound. (laughs) Which would you like to identify first? Trill immediately picks up the loot and starts fiddling with it. Can Vadim try and identify while Trill's doing that one, the compass? Sure. I'll help you, man. Get over here, Norman, you scurvy dog. <laughs> so you spend 10 minutes. I'm guessing you're not hanging out in this steadily sinking dinghy. Like maybe you, you get <laughs> it back Mag to the is shore. Yeah, Mag, us Mag ashore. hops out and swims and everybody right. else uh, gets a ballast point. <laughs> Norman, as the captain, you have to go down with the ship. <laughs> Mag will swim over to the dragon and see if there's anything fun on the dragon's uh, person. Okay, so Mag investigates the dragon as Vadim will take will do either a arcana, nature, occultism, or religion check to identify this compass and any of those same checks from Trill to identify this loot. Um, while Norman and Vadim are trying to identify the compass, Norman whispers to him, I was just kidding, man. I, I don't really care about the compass. Could I have that tooth? Oh, 
Yeah, of course, of course. Oh, thanks, and, thanks. And he ha- hands the the tooth to uh, Norman. Oh, it's a big this one. Is a good one. Ooh. Nice work, man. So, what's Norman's uh, aid on that identify? Oh, it was a twenty four to aid on a. So that's going to succeed, nice. meaning that uh, Vadim will get a plus one to his identify check, and that means that he successfully identifies this item as a wayfinder, which is a object that is used by the Pathfinder Society for a number of different things. One thing that it will do is it will generate the light spell if you choose to tell it to. So this thing can be a light source. And it also interacts with these things called Aeon Stones, which are things that you guys have no idea what they are. Uh, um, They're magical stones. Don't worry about it. (laughs) But basically, it's a magical light source that you can, if you find an Aeon sword, uh, an Aeon stone, you can sink it into the Wayfinder. Cool. And only it itself can be light, or you can use it to cast light elsewhere? It it itself can light up. So you can strap it to your your person and generate light off of it that way. That sounds handy. Yeah. And Trill, doing her own occultism check to identify the loot, identifies this as a maestro's instrument. What? And this does two things. It is a beautifully crafted, magically imbued musical instrument. One thing it will do is it'll give you a bonus to per to performance checks Ooh. with the instrument. Nice. And the other thing is that you can, once per day, spend two actions to cast the charm spell from the instrument with a DC of 17. So it's something of a low DC, but you might get lucky. You never know. I mean, I got rid of charms. That's kind of nice to have it back. And Mag finishes her investigation of the the body of the drake, and it's it's a, a natural sort of beast. There are no pockets or anything like that on it. So beyond... The, the sort of natural features of the creature you don't find much of interest. Kind of a dead drake. It's kind of a dead drake. Well, Mac has an interest in that sort of thing. I like to think while all this is going on, Norman is like, hey, hey can I see that? And he's taking the wayfinder and he's doing like the uh, the little kid thing of turning the light on and off, which is like deeply distracting <laughs> to everyone else. He's like flashing it on and off. So it's creating sort of like a sickening strobe in this cavern. Oh, I'm not feeling so. Oh, boy. oh d- dude, you look you look bad. Hey, Tro, let's let's can we fix him here? Here, I got this man. And and Norman goes to do a, a medicine check on Fadim. No, uh, hang on, oh, I, I think I okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a failure. As Norman spends ten minutes trying to patch up Vadim's wounds. Here, we wounds. just need a little gauze, and it's just this mucus here. Here, uh, and Nor- he, like, Norman, licks the no gauze many... and wipes. I, oh, God, Norman, now, now I'm, I can't move my left arm. It, there's too <laughs> much gauze here, Norman. This is too much gauze. <laughs> well, then you fix it. I don't know. You just be patient. Vadim uh, uh, will also try and make a medicine check himself okay, through the gauze. Okay, so, so that's, that's going to be 50 minutes later, Vadim is is set for that. So we are coming up on 9.50 in the morning now as Vadim sets to deal with his own wounds. That is an 18. I'm going to say that by the by the time Vadim patches up his wounds, everybody will have been able to take lay on hands to be fully healed up. So right around 10 o'clock in the morning, everyone is at full health. I feel like it took us so long because everyone Oops. is queasy from the flashing light in this cavern. Like right. you would be able to better focus if Norman weren't just constantly beep boop yes. beep boop beep boop <laughs> with the, with the wayfinder. And, um, yeah, Trill is <laughs> is tuning her new loot, and so while she's tuning and um, playing with her new loot, she would regain her focus spells or focus points. Yes, of course. At the end of the hour, Norman sidles over to Trill and he goes, "That's that's a beautiful instrument." <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where I can add the flask to it, like I have in my heart. <laughs> I think you just plug up one of the chambers, right? You don't need the C-sharp over there, so just plug that one up and, I don't know, put some uh, put some moonshine in there. Because, you know, you don't want to have to carry around too many things. I like having multi-purpose tools. Mag stares into, stares into the middle distance and just whispers to herself, carrying too many things is awful. <laughs> <laughs> 
back. Speaking of carrying things, it sounds like Norman is taking the Wayfinder. The the one thing about it that I would say is that neither Mag nor oh, you guys don't the have, have access. And it seems like the kind of thing you could hang on a belt, potentially, and yeah, just leave it activated. Yeah, I think maybe Vadim take it. Maybe uh, Vadim snatches it away from Norman. He's like, enough of that. Uh, Norman, you're making us all sick. It, it, it's really not helpful right now. I, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to come down so hard on you. I, I feel like I was a real jerk the other. Anyway. No, no, it's it's cool, says Norman, obviously deeply wounded. <laughs> As far as the wand goes, though, because only casters can use wands anyway, right? Correct. So only Norman or I could use the wand. Mm. But the what that wand is useful for uh, using a weapon after the wand, right? Right. So I feel like that's a Norman item. It could be a spell attack roll too, right? I still I still feel like Norman should. That's more useful to Norman than for Trill. I think that's right. Plus yeah. that ties yeah. into his wand, his big plans of wand usage. What with trick magical yeah. items that he doesn't get to mm. use yet. Lars, it looks as though there are possibly other air er- like other areas openings that led into this. I know that we've seen it from two different angles. So which ways can we potentially go through this cavern here? So this cavern has the southern shore that you just came through. There's a northern shore that um that you have seen from another angle when you fought that uh Minotaur skeleton that one okay. time. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. And then there's an exit out to the west that just leads out into the swamp. It just leads outside. Oh, like okay. surface. Oh, oh, oh. Mag, seeing that there's nowhere new in the cavern to explore. She's just been treading water the whole time over by the dragon body. <laughs> <laughs> just Get her training. cardio in. Just right. Just, <laughs> just training. So she'll uh, get back out of the water to the south and walk back through, back through the rooms that have led to this cavern. So there's the... Um, sort of pile of boats, and then there's a very narrow tunnel that leads back to the back door uh, of the room where they first met Grolgist. Um, and her intention is to go back through Grolgist's throne room and through the unexplored door out of it. Yeah, so you you find yourselves in in this throne room. It is a disgusting room. It is so gross. All of you vomited here several times. The, <laughs> this exploded uh, grothlet put poison all over the place. This is the most disgusting place you have yet to see. And Vadim killed the guy who was cleaning it. And <laughs> yes, and <laughs> Look, it will never be cleaned. I may have been a little hasty, okay? <laughs> there's a door in the southeastern portion of this room that you have yet to go through. And there's also like a hallway that the Grolgust came out of, or not Grolgust, the um, whatever the slug that the, thing that was. That the Grothlet came through. Grothlet. Yes, there's a hole in the wall in the southern part of the room that the Grothlet emerged from. The door feels right, unless I want to check out the Grothlet's den eventually. And y'all have the same feeling as me, right? That that we're walking into this booby-trapped area, but through the back way that's not where it's not going to spring the Well, trap, we should be so. ready. We should be yeah, ready, yeah, right? I, yeah. I feel yeah. like Norman gets his rapier out to, like, poke at stuff. So it sounds like all of you are searching for traps, given that you are aware that there are traps here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Which I'm going to say gives you a hefty bonus to that check. Mag eases the door open and finds herself looking into a hallway. The north and south walls of the hallway have been decorated with a bewildering array of timbers, metal parts, gears, bits of broken weapon, and trash. And the four of you, with the extra information from Grolgust, are able to quickly spot trip lines going across this hallway one every five feet and then repurposed crossbows connected to those tripwires so mag kneels kneels very gingerly down in place where she is in the doorway and and gestures to the tripwire she sees along the ground and says norman can you take a look at these anything you know how to handle oh yeah i got this so Norman can uh, can either make a thievery check to dis- to dismantle these these things one by one, or step over the tripwires. Can Trill um, aid Norman in a thievery check to help sure. him disarm if he chooses to to do that? 
I mean, this would be no problem for me, but we should probably protect anyone else who comes through here, right? So let's just let's just cut yeah. him down. I just do it faster. Also, if Trill helps, I imagine. Uh, it's a twenty-three for the first thievery check for Norman, and that's a twenty on the die for Trill Ooh. to make a twenty-eight. Nimble little fingers. Trill and Norman effortlessly dismantle the first trap. See, easy peasy. Lemon squeezy. Uh, it's a Good twenty job. for Norman on the next one. Uh, twenty-five for Trill. The next tripwire gets snipped and is now no longer an issue. The next tripwire kills you. Um, <laughs> ooh, that was very close to a natural one, but it wasn't. That's a 21 for Norman. Three out of four tripwires are cut as Trill and Norman speedily move down the hallway. All right, this last one surely can't go that well. Uh, it's a 14 for Norman on the last one. Uh, Trill got a 22. And it is only from Trill's aid. Ooh. Here we go. That's absolutely enough to dismantle the fourth of these tripwires. Thanks, Trill. Teamwork makes the dream work. This hallway leads to the east, and there is a door waiting on the other side of it. Mag, you want to? Let's, let's do it, right? And she opens the next door. And Mag finds herself pushing into what looks like an ancient office. There is a desk with a chair sitting in the middle of the room with three empty picture frames hanging on the walls. Hmm. And there's also an ancient looking clockwork device here. Oh. A large, immobile, humanoid figure made of springs and gears. And as you look closer at it, you get the impression that you could potentially dismantle this item and recover some valuables from it. Potentially take some of these these ancient springs and gears and and, and recover them. Yeah, Mag steps forward and examine sort of like very carefully and gingerly she turns her head this way and that examining um the the design and the the um sort of craft of this um curious object i want to use crafting to to try to see what this thing is how it works or what can be recovered from it totally so as you look at it you open a small panel on it and you look at the inner workings of this and you see a beautifully intricate gear that you have confidence is worth some money what i would like you to do is give me a crafting check to try to recover this gear without breaking it okay while mag is doing that norman norman comes in and he's like what the what the hell is this this what is this doing down here clockwork oh my god why would this even be down here it has no place this is, he's like clearly just weirdly bent out of shape, but like, what what the hell is there even just like, a, a, oh, they made it into a a person? I mean, this is ridiculous. They just, they they won't go away. They think they have a place everywhere and it doesn't mean anything. Uh, would you stay calm for a moment? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to dismantle it. Uh. Uh, um, and he's, uh, we, we do this with our dog. We call it buffing. Um, when she like sees an intruder, <laughs> he's kind of just he's buffing for for like it's like not a full on bark. She knows better, but so normally right. she sits there, she, yeah. she wants to <laughs> bark, and we're telling her don't bark. So she's like, fine, I'm technically not barking, but she keeps making this passive aggressive little noise. Hank does that as my dog does that uh, as well. I call it woofing, like uh, not a woof, but a woof. Yeah, it's a woof. Yeah. It's a boof. Yeah. yeah. Woof. Woof. Uh, so as as Norman um, engages in a in a curiously canine behavior uh, for uh, his present form, <laughs> um, that's uh, the crafting check for Mag is a twenty. So Mag is able to steady her hands and wrap her fingers around this gear and manages to pull it out, keeping it fully intact, recovering a intact intricate gear worth forty gold pieces. Woo. Oh, okay, well. Nice. Let's get some more striking runes. Am I right? Uh, all right. <laughs> yeah, we dismantled it, says Norman, and he just like flings around all the remaining pieces around the room. Troll ducks. All right. So it looks like t- there's a couple more doors in here, Lars. Yeah. You open the two doors. One leads back to the west 
into a what looks like an abandoned washroom and the uh, this natural cavern that the Grothlet seems to have lived in. But the door to the east pushes forward into that uh, large room with the rubble where you fought the Morlocks and fought uh, Zosler and the Zabub. There are six doors in front of you that you have yet to explore. And as you push them open one by one, you see that each of them is sort of like a dormitory room. They look like a servant's bedroom that would have been abandoned hundreds of years ago. Can I just point out a moment of appreciation for Narki's map here of so even good. having like the faintest kind of residue of goo from the glo- from the groth glut left over in the cave where the groth glut lived. Yeah, there's like a little <laughs> yeah, trail. It's, awesome. <laughs> it's, so it's, it's really gross. It's, so it's gross. Really gross. servant good. room is like a little different. It's good. Oh. Yeah, you're so right. There's two There's two big um, piles of Grothlet slime, one where it started and one where it ended up in the Morlocks <laughs> throne room, connected by this this trail of, of moisture. But but you you open the doors for, for six identical servants' bedrooms in this portion of the room, and as you walk across the, the, the larger room to the other two doors you, you hadn't yet explored, you see... Yeah, you see two more of these servants' bedrooms. So this entire area seems as though it was a dormitory for housing workers. Can we just like a uh, kind of blanket, just say we investigate them all looking for things like little things tucked away anywhere? Gears worth 40 gold, whatever. As you, as you pass through these rooms, you search them thoroughly and you, you're able to, to get the sense that the Morlocks that had moved into this area have stripped everything of value out of it. Oh, Jerks. weird. Um, so they get back then to the... Ro- we're back in the room where, where we killed the Zelbub, right? Or where Vadim, I should say, killed the Zelbub? Yeah, you're here in this rubble-filled <laughs> room where you know uh, hundreds of years ago, Otari Ilvashti fell through the floor where you fought four Morlocks. Their bodies have been neatly stacked up in the corner and then... Zoslerin, the Zabub's body is also here. Poor Zoslerin. He, he told us about an, another trap. Uh, I mean, to the north, and, and he said it was it could kill us. I think we're doing traps. We're doing good with traps. We're doing good today. Let's let's go get rid of that one and, and see if we can figure out. He said he never went past it. Like, what, what's past it? There must be something good past it. I do like a good mystery. So to get to that room with the traps that Zoslerin described the location for, you walk down that long hallway, that sort of main north-south hallway that ends in the washroom where you spotted the ghostly green writing. Norman's like, the, up here to the north, the, the, around the corner. Be careful. You push past the washroom to the west, and you see double doors leading to the north into a room that you have not yet explored. All right, these doors we ignored. Heck, you want, you want to do the honors? And what are you guys doing as you're exploring right now? Um, Mag will scout for enemies. Vadim will search for traps or anything else of interest. Same. Now, he had said that these were these were not like a regular trap. These were things that zapped us, right? That's what he said. Yeah. Trill, Trill's gonna raise. Her, she's gonna do her magical shield. Okay. Mm, smart. Mm, yeah. So Norman and Vadim both search for traps. And you push the doors open. And you see a large 10 foot wide L shaped hallway. It stretches out in front of you and then turns to the east. You can see a number of alcoves. Each of them contains a small diorama of the same city facing different perils. The ones in front of you, you see the city is burning to the ground. There's a fire devastating the city. To the right, the alcove shows an enormous tsunami poised to crush the entire city. In the distance, you can see an enormous tentacled monster poised above the diorama of the city. And then even further, you can sort of make out a diorama showing an army of the undead marching to destroy the city. Do we recognize the city? I think you do. 
you see that this is the so-called city at the center of the world, the largest city in Galarian, Absalom, oh. a few days' journey away from Otari. Well, whatever else happens, we cannot let this fate befall Absalom. It's unthinkable. Could these be all the things that the lighthouse is capable of doing? Or is this all what Belcoral wants to do? He's to harvest souls. I don't know if we speak about her in the present tense or the past tense anymore. And Vadim and Norman are scanning the area forward. And wherever this trap is, they're not seeing it now. Uh, so what perfect. do you guys do? Um, Mag will will uh, reach behind her to her back. She'll take out a javelin. Oh, no. And she'll toss it a few feet forward into the room to see whether the movement, the sound, the pressure on the ground, any of that might trigger the trap. Good thinking, Mag. Mag tosses her javelin forward in front of the alcove showing the city burning. And as the javelin <gasps> gently flies through the air, a beam of energy launches outward from the model of Gauntlet poised near the city, vaporizes the javelin, and we will pick up from there next time. Oh, oh boy. snap! <laughs> now how? you can't even think what? about that javelin because it's gone. How do, how do we even get past this thing? The Roots of Ruin is a tabletop gold production produced under the Paizo Incorporated Community Use Policy. The Roots of Ruin uses trademarks and or copyrights owned by Paizo Inc. used under Paizo's Community Use Policy. We are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. Paizo does not recognize, endorse, or sponsor this project in any way. Original characters and content are the property of tabletop gold. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. We at Tabletop Gold would love to hear from you. Email us at letters at tabletopgold.com and find all our social links at tabletopgold.com. Mm-hmm.